Hello, good afternoon. We're just waiting for folks to come uh, to start participants to start showing up and then we will start our AHRI Safe Refrigerant Transition Task Force. So we'll start in a minute or two. We're just waiting for participants to join. Again, good afternoon. Thank you for joining our AHRI Safe Refrigerant Transition Task Force webinar. We're just giving folks another minute to join. Hello and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our AHRI Safe Refrigerant Transition Task Force webinar. We're very glad you could join us today. Our webinar today will be joint tie-ups and A2L refrigerants. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Nick. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to let you know who I am. I'm Mary Coben, Senior Director, Regulatory Affairs, AHRI. I'm pleased to be bringing the AHRI webinar series to you. Um, very excited about this. And now let me introduce our great set of panelists for today. Uh, next slide, please. We have Stefan Elbel, uh, Chief Engineer at Creative Thermal Solutions and also research assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Stefan has 25 years of fundamental and applied research and development in HVACR. Uh, he's been focusing on low GWP refrigerant alternatives for mobile and stationary applications. He's also the associate director of the air conditioning and Refrigeration Center at the University of Illinois. He's been at, very active and continues to be active in ASHRAE, SAE, IIR, IIAR, uh, ASME, and DKV, and has both a PhD and MS in mechanical engineering from uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. We're also very lucky, next slide please, to have Craig Greider, who's the Assistant Chief of, uh, of Engineer of Intertech. Uh, Craig has 20 years in HVAC and refrigeration industry. 10 of those years have been with Intertech testing uh, and certifying products for the global market. Craig is also on numerous um, uh, industry panels, including ASHRAE, ANSI, CSA, UL, and IEC, uh, where he assists in developing standards and codes within the HVAC, R, and gas industries. Uh, he studied electrical engineering at Texas Tech, a mechanical engineering at the University of uh, Arlington, Texas. And he also has an interdisciplinary degree in engineering and mathematics. And then our final panelist for the day is Sean Kelleher. Uh, he is the director of engineering at Rapid Locket Systems. Sean started with RLS uh, since its beginning in 2015. He's also one of the inventors of the RLS Press Connect fitting in back in 2012. He works on product development and technical support. He also a lot in code compliance, ensuring the Press Connect fittings meet requirements. And he studied mechanical engineering at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. With that said, I'd like to go on and uh, go over the webinar we're going to do today. I'm going to give a brief update on the regulatory background. Uh, then um, Stefan is going to go over the ASHRAE research project. Craig is going to discuss UL 207, the standard and the testing. And then Sean is going to show us some really great info on uh, a Press Connect uh, fittings and a demo. And then we'll come back and give you a summary of the topic today. So first, let's go on to the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act and why we're making this transition today. 
Uh, the American uh, Innovation and Manufacturing, or AIM Act, requires a transition to lower global warming potential refrigerants. Uh, it, the AIM Act is going to reduce the supply of current refrigerants, uh, and we're going to go to low GWP refrigerants. And here's some of the transition dates to low GWP refrigerants. Uh, today, already, we have plug-in appliances and light-duty vehicles that use low GWP refrigerants. Uh, we expect in 2022, commercial refrigeration, California will go over to low GWP refrigerants. 2024, commercial refrigeration in Washington will go over uh, to low GWP refrigerants uh, and also chillers. In 2025, residential and light commercial air conditioning and probably 2026, um, the remaining uh, commercial refrigeration will go over uh, to low GWP refrigerants. What do we need to know, next slide, uh, about the new refrigerants? Uh, many of the new low GWP refrigerants are ASHRAE A2L. Uh, we've been discussing the ASHRAE A2L refrigerants uh, a lot in our seminar series. Um, one thing to remember is all these new refrigerants uh, must be approved by the US EPA through the SNAP process. As part of that process, EPA has to look at the safety, toxicity, flammability, and environmental factors before approving these refrigerants. And all flammable refrigerants are subject to additional safety requirements uh, by the EPA. Um, next slide, please. And the transition to low GWP refrigerants. So what's the same? Well, what's the same? The combustion products for all fluorinated refrigerants are HF gas and HF acid uh, after water is used during a combustion event. Uh, oxygen deprivation is possible in tight and enclosed spaces if I have a large leak. Frostbite is also possible due to quickly releasing uh, liquid refrigerant. Um, PPE, including uh, self-contained breathing apparatus, is a necessary part of firefighting. Now what's different? Um, the refrigerant transition will require lower and actually some higher flammability refrigerants uh, to comply with the upcoming regulations. Lower flammability uh, refrigerants or A2L refrigerants are characterized by a low flame speed. The burning velocity is less than 10 centimeters per second, and they also have a low heat of combustion. The higher flammability refrigerants, uh, which are the hydrocarbons such as propane or butane or isobutane, uh, have higher flame speeds and higher heat of combustion. And what do I need to do about this? And what do I need to know about this? Well, we've really been concentrating a lot on the A2L refrigerants as part of our series. Uh, we expect a, a lot of folks will be transitioning over to those uh, uh, in the shorter term. Uh, those A2L refrigerants are difficult to ignite, have a slow uh, flame speed, have a low heat of combustion, and stakeholders such as yourselves must be aware of and trained in the mitigation of risk due to the lower flammability or higher toxicity properties associated with the new refrigerants. So one of the things we've been talking about, if you would go to the next slide is, um, some of the things we've been focusing on over the last few webinars are the standards uh, that will be used uh, to um, employ these refrigerants. And one of the things we wanted to highlight again are uh, the UL standards that we've been talking about and we were sharing with folks in the last couple uh, seminar series that the national standards are really derived from international standards. Uh, and in the US, uh, we use uh, the UL uh, standards uh, for our national standard uh, developing organization. Uh, next slide, please. Now, when we start talking about the uh, ASHRAE research project, I just wanna put a few things into context. Uh, Stefan is going to give us a great overview of a recent project that was done with ASHRAE and uh, you see that uh, a lot of uh, information is presented in that and there will be some information on uh, connections and fittings and the leaks of those and what I would like to share with everyone is that um, the leaks that are shown uh, four grams per year uh, will be highlighted as some of the leaks that were found and some were actually even lower but one of the things I want folks to note is at a leak rate of four grams per year, it would take more than 450 years to release four pounds of refrigerant. And in order to reach the lower flammability 
of these A2L refrigerants, you would have to leak four pounds of A2L refrigerant in a room that's about five by five room with an eight foot ceiling. Um, however, most rooms are typically about 10 feet by 10 feet uh, by eight feet or 800 uh, cubic feet. So again, it's going to take an awful long time to ever reach that lower flammability level. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just kind of highlighting what I said. Uh, fittings which leak less than four grams will take years and years and years to reach the LFL. And with that said, I want to turn this over uh, to Stefan to talk about uh, the ASHRAE Research Project. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Stefan, and um, I will talk about um, the results of uh, ASHRAE Project RP1808 um, that we recently completed um, at uh, CTS. The title of the project was Assessment of Leakage Rate and Durability of Field-Made field Mechanical Joints for Systems Using Low GWP Flammable Refrigerants. I know that is uh, quite a mouthful, so uh, what did we really focus on here? So we were tasked with uh, evaluating um, the robustness and especially the leak tightness of mechanical joints, especially the field-made mechanical joints that we use in refrigeration systems. And uh, what we looked at here was a series of uh, assembly tests, um, harshness or durability tests, uh, followed by uh, detailed leak rate tests. And uh, some of the specifics of the projects you can see on this slide, um, we used uh, R32 as an example of an A2L uh, refrigerant. Um, so that was used in the project. Um, particular focus, and that was given by Asher to us, um, we were supposed to focus on flame-free joining uh, methods. So we included um, press or so-called crimp fittings, compression fittings, and flare type fittings. You will also see once in a while some reference to brace joints, um, which we added a few, um, but really more as a, as a baseline so, uh, for comparison. Um, we also included um, the consideration of human factors on assembly time and success. Um, what that means is we had uh, technicians with a good experience level, well-trained, um, and we also had a group of less experienced um, technicians, and we were comparing in the end um, the results. Also, we included um, some difficult levels of difficulty um, in making the joints. Uh, next slide, please. You see on uh, this slide um, the types and sizes of fittings that were included in the study. So in the leftmost column, you see two different sizes of uh, crimp or press fittings. Um, you see in the middle, uh, conventional compression fittings also uh, in two different sizes. And in the right column, you see two different sizes of flare connections. Um, there's a little note on the left where you see that we also included different uh, material combinations uh, so for some of them, we used uh, aluminum, for others we used copper, but however, we did not see uh, any substantial difference. So uh, for the purpose of this webinar, we don't need to differentiate much um, between the different uh, materials. So um, for each of these uh, six different uh, fittings that you see on the screen, uh, we did 50 uh, repetitions, so 50 uh, samples of each, so 300 uh, fittings total. And we added, as I mentioned, uh, 25 of the brace joints as a, as a baseline. Um, you see on the, in the table underneath uh, some of the specs um, that were provided by the suppliers um, supporting the study with um, the raw materials here with the fittings. And uh, maybe the, the bottom um, row is important. Uh, is the fitting reusable or not? You can imagine if you make a press fitting, once you have done the, 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 the fitting, uh, once you have made the connection, you're pretty much done. So the, the connection has been established while the compression and the flares are reusable or you, know, you can retighten them as needed, and you will see that this plays a substantial role when you talk about leaks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here is a, a little bit better overview, I hope, um, over um, what we have done for these uh, individual fittings. Let me start on the left side here. So as I said, for each of these 50 um, different um, samples that we had per um, fitting type and, and size, um, we had 20 fittings made by experienced technicians under normal conditions. 10 fittings made by the experienced technicians um, under difficult conditions. Difficult conditions, by that I mean what I'm showing on the right here. Um, we had um, a uh, mock-up uh, refrigeration cabinet where we asked the technician to make the, the connection on the uh, reduced uh, um, or increased the kind of difficulty level. So technician had to work um, with hands uh, above their, their, their heads, um, reduced visibility, hard to reach, you know, the, the, the good stuff here. 
Um, then uh, 10 fittings were assembled by the inexperienced technicians under normal conditions. Maybe just to give you a little bit of uh, um, kind of background on this one. Uh, inexperienced technicians we chose uh, from our graduate students. Graduate students are of course known to be uh, reasonably smart people, but maybe not uh, known for their um, you know, hands-on talents in, in, in most cases. So we used those as a, as a group um, to represent inexperienced. Um, and then finally, 10 fittings were assembled by inexperienced technicians under these difficult conditions in the cabinet shown on the right. After that was done, we um, uh, exposed all of these uh, fittings uh, to an initial leak test, a simple nitrogen test, a binary test, just to make sure or to assess um, how many fittings were made uh, successfully in the first uh, shot. Um, and there was a chance to retighten or redo those uh, if possible. Then we exposed uh, these um, groups of fittings that we've shown here um, to the different harshness tests. We talk about that in more detail. So in, in essence, three different uh, harshness tests, uh, pressure temperature cycling, pre-thaw cycling, and uh, mechanical vibration. Afterwards, again, we did um, a basic nitrogen test to see if there were any immediate failures, um, harsh failures from the, the harshness testing. And then uh, for those fittings that had passed, um, we um, did a more detailed uh, leak test um, with the R32 um, vapor refrigerant. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here we see the first results. Um, after that initial assembly, um, you see here these um, boxes in green and uh, magenta color, um, where we uh, show the difference between experienced and uh, inexperienced uh, technicians. Um, what we see is that the press fittings in those uh, second and third rows uh, consistently had uh, very short assembly times, um, also for, for both uh, technician groups. Um, we also noticed that um, assembly difficulty has a small but noticeable effect on the assembly time, um, especially for the experienced technicians to the brace and the, the press fittings. If you look at that um, table in a little bit more detail, you will note even on the right side here, that um, for some of the inexperienced technicians, um, you know, the difficult situation actually required less time to assemble. We believe that this was maybe some initial kind of training um, kind of um, effect that the inexperienced folks um, saw here. And then, you know, they got a little bit more confident and despite the fact that it was more difficult, um, they actually sped up a little bit. Um, what we see, however, though, is um, the technician experience level um, has far more significant effect um, on the assembly time than the difficulty level. Uh, next, please. We see here now um, what are the results after that initial binary um, nitrogen test, so a simple leak test. And uh, we were able to see um, several things here. Um, the first was um, that um, the compression and the flare fittings, uh, both types very prone to leaks, especially for the larger size fittings. Um, we also noticed that um, larger flare fittings um, could not be sealed properly by the inexperienced technicians. You see here, uh, failure rates 10 out of 10. So literally, you know, every, every fitting um, was bad. Um, and, um, and that is maybe a little bit more surprising is that the initial leaks um, that were observed uh, at fairly similar rates between experienced and um, inexperienced technicians. We also believe that the failures observed for manufacturer independent. So, that, um, you know, with uh, fittings from different suppliers, we would have seen very, very similar results. Um, we should also note here that um, the uh, press fittings um, look very good in this one, um, and the brace fittings, aside from the inexperience under the difficulty, uh, difficult assembly, um, also look very good. Um, next slide, please. Um, then after uh, it was uh, assessed that uh, some of these fittings had some initial leak problems um, and for those fitting types that were able to, to be retightened, like the compressions and the flares, we gave those technicians again a chance to redo their work or to improve their work. And we see that um, by doing so, um, our uh, results look uh, far better. So, however, we still see that we have noticeably higher failure rates on the compressions and the flares and the, the braced for the inexperienced technicians. I mean, this is something we would expect uh, in comparison to, to well-trained technicians. Um, maybe in this, as I, as I mentioned, was maybe a little bit uh, um, unexpected. I think this was despite similar rates of that initial failure um, prior to um, you know, being allowed to fixing or, or redoing it. Um, we also saw that uh, assembly difficulty did not seem to affect the failure rate uh, much, maybe except for those brace joints um, by the inexperienced technicians. And there, um, you know, some of the folks simply gave up after <laughs> after long enough attempt uh, because they couldn't um, close the leaks. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so working on some of the, the failures that we observed. Um, we see here on the braced fittings, uh, the braced joints, um, the incomplete brace. So you see some you know, gap or some opening that uh, the inexperienced technicians here weren't able to, to fully seal. Um, on the press fitting, as far as I remember, there was only one failure um, that came from uh, an assembly where the tube was not inserted far enough into the fitting. You see in the, in the, in the background there, there's an O-ring that uh, got a little bit displaced, so that was the, the problem there. For the compression fittings, we had uh, more failures. We had uh, damaged threads um, from, uh, from cross-threading, basically. We had uh, tubes not uh, inserted uh, deep enough, so the perils did not, not fully bite. Um, we also had some problems, as shown here on the left, um, with over tightening. On the flare fittings, we had uh, flares that were not deep enough to hold the nut, nut on the tube. Um, we had some flares that, uh, one flare that was made under an angle, and here for the aluminum that we also included, um, there was a cracked flare in, 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 in two places. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is a summary of these uh, assembly observations. Um, so as we said, technician experience uh, level um, had the most significant impact on the assembly tile times and also on the, the failure rates, especially for the brace joints and the flare fittings. Assembly difficulty um, generally did not affect too much the assembly failure rate and had only small effect on assembly time, except as we um, already saw um, for the brace joints done by the inexperienced technicians. The press fittings um, had consistently the shortest assembly times and also the lowest assembly failure rate, so that was a positive result. Um, compression fittings um, were seen to have the second shortest assembly time, but if not done properly, most prone to assembly failure or that initial uh, nitrogen leak that we saw. Uh, flare fittings uh, typically had the longest assembly time and most likely to leak uh, compared to the other fittings, but um, less likely to, res to result in failed assembly compared to the compression fittings. Um, fitting size was important, um, especially on assembly time for the flare fittings, maybe to a lesser extent for the other fittings, uh, fitting types. Um, we also saw that uh, the size had a very large effect on the initial leaks, especially for the flares and the compressions. And as I mentioned, none of the observed failure, failures were due to manufacturing de uh, defects. All of that was um, technician uh, error. Uh, next slide, please. Then um, with the uh, fittings uh, assembled, uh, we started to expose them to the different harshness tests. The first one was a so-called pressure and temperature cycling test. You see on the top right here, the specimen um, all uh, lined up you know, in, in series. Then we connected that uh, fitting tree um, to a modified um, air conditioning or refrigeration uh, system where these test fittings then were exposed um, to cycles of high temperature and high uh, pressure alternating with cycles of low temperature and low pressure. Um, several thousand uh, cycles per fitting, and um, we will see the results in the, the next slide, please. So what we saw, um, the uh, brace fittings and the press fittings, both of them represent the permanent uh, types, had uh, zero failures, um, so that uh, harshness test didn't do anything to, to these type of fittings. Um, we had a very minor failure rate um, with compression and the smaller flares, and I should point out that um, all of these were fixable by retightening it. Uh, next slide. Um, then the second type of harshness test was the so-called freeze-thaw uh, cycling test. Um, so what we did here, um, we took uh, these uh, same fitting trees and exposed them to um, an ambient where we had a fairly humid condition. Um, then, as we varied uh, the temperature of the ambient there, um, between uh, 5 and minus 15 degrees Celsius, uh, there was condensation. Um, and then finally, that condensate um, started to freeze onto the fittings and into the fittings, as you can think of these uh, small gaps and crevices um, in between uh, the fitting connection and the, the tube. And of course, the concern there is that the expanding um, frost um, could potentially do some damage um, to the fitting over time. So we did uh, at least 800 cycles per fitting, and uh, the results are presented in the next slide. Um, similar picture here. Uh, we didn't see any failures on the permanent fittings, uh, such as the braced or the press fittings. So again, very good results here. Um, very similar as before, minor failure rates with the compression fittings, again, fixable by retightening. Um, we saw, you see down there, that uh, row with flare fittings, uh, six out of 20 failures um, at a higher rate, um, especially the smaller size here. However, I should point out that there is um, Escher 147 that recommends against the use of flare fittings in temperatures below freezing, um, you know, especially for this reason, that basically confirms what the Escher standard um, tells us anyway. 
Um, also here I should point out those fittings um, were all fixable uh, through retyping. So next slide, please. Um, the final harshness test was a mechanical vibration test. You see here a test rig um, that consists on the left side of an oscillatory side and in the, the middle there, you see that yellowish kind of color, um, which is the fixed or stationary clamp. The test fitting would be very close in this case to the stationary clamp. We did then um, a pressurized uh, tube to simulate um, uh, realistic conditions and had about 2 million cycles per fitting. And we see that in the next slide, um, the results for this. Um, we had on the larger uh, uh, brace connection here, the one in one eighth size uh, one uh, failure, you see on the right here in the middle, um, a crack um, emanating from the, 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 uh, the joint here. Um, and we saw uh, substantial um, failures on the larger size of the compression and also the larger size of the flare fittings. Um, all the other fittings, again, especially the press, press fittings in both sizes did extremely well. Um, I should also note that um, fittings that were damaged mechanically, those tests, we were not able um, to fix them afterwards, of course, through, through retyping. So they had to be taken out of the, the test. Uh, next slide, please. So again, a summary of, both, uh, of the, the harshness tests that were conducted. Um, brace fittings showed um, one instance of, of leak during vibration, so that uh, damaged fitting. Um, so a little bit difficult to draw meaningful conclusion um, because of the single occurrence. However, um, no failures were observed um, on any of the press fittings. Um, the compression fittings showed uh, some leaks at uh, a rate of 5 to 10% uh, of the specimen after the freeze thaw and the pressure uh, temperature cycling. Both sizes were able to, to fix all of this by retightening. Um, smaller fit, flare fittings showed a considerable higher rate of failure after the freeze thaw cycling. Again, as a reminder, ASHRAE 147 recommends against the use. Um, the real concern is the vibration uh, test for the um, uh, larger size uh, flare and compression fittings, where we saw substantial um, rates of, of permanent failure. Next slide, please. Um, the last uh, topic um, of the ASHRAE project is uh, the more detailed um, leak rate uh, testing. For this, we use a very accurate, um, you see this device here, photoacoustic um, uh, multigas uh, analyzer. Um, we um, place the, the fittings uh, that are investigated in a uh, sealed box. Um, then we can expose uh, the inside of the of that fitting tree um, to R32 pressurized paper. Um, you see that at 40 degrees C and 25 bar. Um, and then we can uh, analyze what are the, 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 the leak rates. Um, next slide, please. And uh, we see the results here. Um, let me walk you through this. Uh, there's uh, quite a bit of information here. So first, on the very left, um, you see that the brace fitting um, has zero leak, which means that validates basically the assumption that you know a fully metallic uh, brace connection um, is leak free. So that, that is as expected. Um, the press fittings, you see the next one, two, three, uh, four columns um, had relatively consistent low leaks, um, very good. Um, really good was uh, the repeatability in that. So they all showed, showed very similar uh, leak rates here. Um, when it comes to the compression and the flare fittings, the, um, the picture is a little bit different. You can see that uh, compression and flare can have lower leak rates than even those press fittings if they are done properly. Um, however, if there's problems in assembly or after a certain type of harshness test, you see how those leak rates can increase. So we need to differentiate a little bit more um, for the compression and the, the flare fittings in this case. But overall, all the leak rates um, were good. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. We just uh, talked about this. And uh, these are the conclusions overall from the project. Um, so the press fittings I want to point out again had the quickest assembly time, uh, lowest uh, assembly failure rates and the most durable. So we didn't see any failures doing any of the harshness tests and they had very acceptable leak rates um, on the order of one gram per year. Per uh, the compression fittings uh, generally um, also have very low leak rates if assembled properly and uh, showed the second quickest assembly time. However, they also showed the highest assembly failure rates if not done properly. The flare fittings um, took significantly longer to assemble um, compared to the other fittings we looked at um, and are more prone to leaks after the assembly. Um, but again, when done properly, they can show the lowest um, leak rates of about 0.2 grams per year per fitting. Um, and um, they're less likely to result in assembly failure compared to the, the compression fittings. Compression and flares uh, can be tightened to have nearly zero leak, um, but they can also have the higher leak rates 
and not done uh, properly. And of course, it's always uh, a question, you know, would you catch all of these leaks that develop maybe um, during operation um, so quickly that uh, you don't lose too much uh, record. Uh, compression and flare fittings are highly prone to failure um, in the larger sizes when exposed to these mechanical vibrations. So that was a finding. And uh, the flare fittings um, prone to failure if used, um, you know, at the very low temperatures below freezing, um, again, which is not recommended um, by the shirt and for itself. And that's all I had prepared. So now I hand it over to Craig, who is going to talk about uh, Euro 207 and the testing uh, needed for certification. Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, uh, I'm going to be giving a quick crash course into certification and looking at refrigerant components. Uh, Nick, if you go ahead and click one more time. And Intertech is a testing agency that co covers what we call ATIC, all right? So assurance, testing, inspection, but today what we're gonna be focusing on is certification. We get our roots, our history from Thomas Edison. I'm gonna show you this on the next slide. Uh, go ahead and click a couple times there. One more, thank you. So there's a lot on this, oh, go back once. <laughs> There's a lot on this slide here, but most importantly, what I want to point out is we get our history, like I said, from Thomas Edison going back to 1896, where Thomas Edison created what he called the uh, Lamp Testing Bureau, which then became the Electrical Testing Laboratory, which is the ETL mark, which we utilize. Now, in 1988, that's when ITS or Intertech acquired ETL, and it's what we've been using to certify in North America ever since. So, uh, Nick, next slide. What is certification? Well, it is general terms. It's a formal confirmation that a product meets or meets all trusted external and internal standards. And what we're basically saying there is in most cases, we're meeting some sort of regulatory requirement. Well, in North America, we certify appliances to industry recognized standards. And the way we develop those is we come together within the industry. We put all of our best uh, leaders and experts on a committee and these committee members they discuss they go through and they 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 compare notes and we say this is the best representation of how to test these types of components products or appliances this then is a done done under an accredited organization and it becomes a standard which we utilize now a, a product can bear a listing mark such as the ETL UL or CSA is showing that it has been tested by Intertech or another testing agency to meet at least the minimum requirements for U.S. or Canadian electrical safety standards. This listing mark reflects a manufacturer's dedication to the ongoing safety and quality of their products. That means it's not just we test it and we're done. There isn't a process that happens um, on a routine basis where we're continuing to tech, test and check to make sure that product does not change from what was originally tested and certified. Uh, next slide, please. So when we're talking HVAC, we have a lot of standards that we, we pick from, uh, depending on what type of uh, HVAC component or appliance it is. But most notably right now, we're talking about 60335-2-40 and UL207, not dash 2-40. Dash it's got quite a big scope. It covers basically anything heating and cooling, which has uh, 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 compressors driven, or it can be water cooled and heated, and also covers electric central heating. Now, UL207 is for non-electrical components and accessories, and it's going to include requirements for testing and safely employing those mechanical type fittings we're discussing today. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just representing uh, that there are really, there's three different standards out there right now for testing refrigerant components, non-electrical refrigerant components. And you can see a list over here on the left, left column of different types of product or components really. And you know, you get your pressure vessels such as accumulators, liquid receivers, oil separators. But Nick, if you could click twice, uh, the, the main focus we wanna talk about is UL207 and fittings and connectors. Now, if you look at UL207, you'll see that uh, there's really, um, that does cover fittings and connectors, and there's only one other standard right now that covers fitting and con connectors uh, type testing, which we utilize for certification, and that's ISO 14903. 
there'll probably be further discussion on this uh, you know, going forward, but again, for today, we're gonna focus on UL 207. It does not apply to braze joints, whereas ISO 14903 does provide testing for braze joints. But again, let's, let's talk about UL 207. So next slide, please. So when we talk about certification and we talk about certifying a component, and specifically refrigerant components that carry a North American listing or recognition type certification, well, that's been done through an accredited certification body. Those can be ETL for Intertech, uh, UL, CSA, right? Those are the most prevalent here in North America. And they carry a mark by the certification body, <coughs> excuse me, that will also have a code or some sort of specific detail of the industry standard to which the component was certified. And here you're seeing an example of that. It's kind of hard to make out, but you can see the listing mark and there's a code or a reference there that it will tell you that that's going to be done to UL 207. Uh, next slide, please. When we talk about the different types of connections and joints, right? We, you know, Stefan uh, mentioned this, that, that mechanical joints are types that include both permanent and non-permanent. So that could be threaded, flared, union, and of course, press or compression. Now, refrigeration appliances that are certified to any of the 60335 series of safety standards must have these components and joints tested to comply with ISO 14903. We have the option of UL 207, but I'll point out here is that UL 207 does not have the same type of testing as ISO 14903. What we do, is we test and certify them to 207 as required by the appliance standard. Meaning, we look at 60335-2-40. It will give us additional guidance and requirements and leakage uh, considerations as to what the product must meet. So we can take a UL207 listed component and all of a sudden now we can get out of some of the appliance testing that's required. And it's the same if you apply it in the installation in the field under ASHRAE 15 or CSA B52. And when you look at the component standard, there's a lot of different tests that are applied, but most notably the ones that we're gonna talk about, it just briefly, are torque, vibration, thermal shock, pressure, and fatigue. Now, if you have a mechanical fitting that, or a mechanical type joint uh, with a fitting that has some sort of sealing material such as a gasket or an o-ring well we have to do some compatibility testing with those as well and we'll talk about that uh, next slide Nick. now when we first get these components to test and certify we have to make sure that we tighten them to a certain specification and that standard gives us guidance on that and you can see here there's a chart that i provided as some examples but of course it goes it goes up into much larger sizes and then all the way down to the smallest sizes that are available in standard uh, connections. And you're going to torque those to these specifications. And you can do it in newton meters, you can do it in pound inches, but this is first and foremost what we have to do before we start testing. And it's important to note, this is always done without the use of a joint compound or any kind of Teflon tape. All right, next slide. The basic, uh, the most important test I'd say is the strength and fatigue, right? This, there's, the, the strength test is just going to take it to the maximum that it could ever be exposed to and not fail. And we look at, there's, there's several ways that we determine what this maximum pressure strength test is, but in most cases, the manufacturer of the component is gonna say, well, this is what we say it's rated for. Well, we're gonna take it three times that. In some cases, we have to take it to five times that, but typically we go three times the mark pressure of the fitting, and it can't fail or leak. And when we say leak, it's not in the sense of like you were seeing in Stefan's presentation where there's actually a measured leak. In UL207, it's more of a visible leak. And what this is done, the way this is done is with water, right? So we fill it with water, and if, it's, if it leaks, you're gonna see water coming from the fitting. The other type of test that's critical is fatigue. And this is the same as the strength test in some instances, but now we're cycling at 250,000 times. So we're pressurizing up to that max point and then coming back down. And then there's some other, it's not always to the maximum pressure, but we're still cycling to whatever that normal pressure is gonna be, 250,000 times. 
And at the end of these tests and during testing, it can't rupture or leak. All right, next slide, please. So you saw in Stefan's, they did some vibration testing. Same thing with when we do certification. Now what it's gonna be subjected to is a 1,000 vibrations per minute at an amplitude of one eighth of an inch. And this is going to be subjected, uh, and you can kind of see it represented there on a graph, and that's a millisecond. So it's, it's vibrating very rapidly. And at the end of this testing, again, it's got to pass all of those leakage tests. All right, next slide. When we I, just, I mentioned briefly that you could have sealing materials such as a gasket or an O-ring. And when those are used, we have to do these compatibility tests. And what we're looking for is the first part of it is the refrigerant that it could be exposed to. Right. And so you're talking a fitting. So if you've seen ASHRAE 34 or ISO 817, or you know the type of refrigerants that are available in the market, there's a lot. Well, they have to be subjected. Uh, these fittings have to be subjected to every single one of those. So that gasket or elastomeric material, we subject it to that liquid refrigerant for 30 days. And then the other part of this test is the oil. So the oil that's in the refrigerant. But we got to make sure it's compatible with it and it's not going to cause it to expand too far and become and degrade. Well, we just expose it to an industry standard IRM 903 oil for 70 hours. At the conclusion of all these tests, we're going to look at the volume, swelling, tensile strength, and elongation. And if those go beyond the allowed parameters, it, it, it's a failure. So the next slide, please. So we do all these tests, we, we certify the product, but it doesn't end there. In most cases, um, you're looking at a minimum of once per year that these components must be subjected to a complete fatigue test again. And then at the discretion of us, the certification bodies, we can add additional testing dependent on what we see while we're evaluating and certifying the product. So just because you see a certification mark, don't think that we tested it once and it was done. It's an ongoing process to make sure that the materials that the manufacturer is using and the assembly or the production of those is, is maintaining the same level of, uh, of control that they did when they first subjected it to certification testing. That's it. This was just a quick crash course. Now I'm going to turn it over to Sean. He's going to talk about some more specifics with his type of product. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean, and I'm going to give a brief uh, overview for Press Connect fittings uh, for HVAC. Uh, talk a little bit more about the uh, RP1808 uh, study, and then uh, wrap things up with uh, a little tutorial on on installation guide for for these types of fittings. So. Press Connect fittings themselves aren't really new. Um, they've been utilized for uh, decades now uh, in the plumbing market uh, for water press. Um, they're, they're very common uh, in, that, in that arena. Um, but as far as HVACR and, and high pressure systems such as that, uh, they're relatively new. Um, the first fittings were brought to market in 2015. Um, and since then, there, there have been some other, uh, some other products brought to market that, that that fit into this uh, into this usage, um, but basically they're they're connected using a mechanized tool, a press tool. Again, very similar to the ones that are used uh, today for plumbing fittings. Uh, next slide. Uh, a lot of the benefits of HVACR press um, are shared um, to some extent with those that you see in water uh, water press, but uh, in this instance, I mean you have no flames. Uh, so there's no burn permits. There's there's no need for fire watch. Um, so so there's a level of uh, potential time savings there. Um, there's no need for for silver solder um, or nitrogen purge. Both uh, you know silver solder as a material itself is is quite costly, um, and then and then obviously the nitrogen purge uh, is an additional cost and and time required for it. Um, because if you don't purge the system, what ends up happening is you have your tubing inside looking like the sample there on the right. Um, and when that, that oxidation flakes off and, and flows through your system, it can easily clog your filters and, 
and basically ruin your ruin your system. Um, there's no need to drag around your heavy tanks of oxyacetylene or oxygen and acetylene gas. Excuse me. Um, you don't have to lug it upstairs, up onto a roof, uh, any of that sort of stuff. Um, and you now, one of the things with installing press is its repeatability. The tool does the same action every time you pull the trigger. Um, and so, so there's, a, there's a high level of repeatability and consistency uh, with the joints. Uh, next slide. Uh, what we have here is just an example of, of a press jaw for HVACR and how it differs slightly from what is, is common, perhaps, again, in the plumbing, uh, in the water press side of things, uh, with the press being offset to one side. Um, and the O-ring being uh, um, to the side of the two bands. Um, another point of emphasis with this particular model is the, uh, the crimp or the press band itself is circular, um, 360 degree full circle. And whereas again, those who are familiar with plumbing press uh, is more hexagonal shaped. So, so that, is, that is a slight difference um, in that regard. Uh, next slide. Uh, so Craig kind of just talked about it uh, in, in brief terms as far as 207 is concerned. Um, but just to kind of touch base on it again, uh, you have the strength and fatigue portion. Uh, as, as he mentioned, manufacturers will typically uh, list uh, higher operating pressures than, than what is, uh, is necessary per the standard. For example, 410A uh, is the highest typical refrigeration, I guess, uh, refrigerant, aside from CO2. CO2 is the highest, I believe that's currently in the UL 207 standard, but the pressure at which your, the minimum pressure for 410A, I believe in the standard is somewhere around 430 PSI or 440 PSI, um, which, which makes the requirements relatively low. Um, so in, in this instance, um, you have a, manufacturer who's got a 700 PSI operating pressure. Um, so for that strength test, that's gonna, that's gonna necessitate at least a 2100 PSI strength hold. Uh, Ping-ponging over to the fatigue testing, uh, the first hit, the first cycle for the fatigue test would be at that max operating pressure of 700 PSI. And then every alternating uh, cycle from there out would alternate between anywhere from 50 PSI up to 450 PSI. Um, with the new standard changes that were implemented um, January of last year, there are now uh, two additional supplementary tests required for refrigerant fittings, uh, that being the pull test and the vibration test, which both are based off uh, UL test standard 109. Um, in addition to these two supplementary additions, there is now uh, an additional, I guess, alternative method to, to compliance, which is going through ISO 14903. Uh, next slide. Uh, so real quick, with Press Connect products for HVAC, you get the same kind of um, SKU offerings and size offerings that you would find in a typical, uh, whether it's compression fitting, flare fitting, uh, or brace fitting. Uh, next slide. And, and there's a, there are uh, ancillary product offerings as well that are, that are compatible with with these types of fittings. Next slide. Uh, to touch briefly again on the RP1808 uh, testing, um, the harshness tests themselves were based on tests pulled from ISO 14903, uh, which is in and of itself a qualification for joint tightness. Um, and so it is very, very particular on the control levels of which acceptable leak limits are designated. Um, so pulling directly from the standard, there are two levels. One is hermetic and one is closed. Um, aside from there being a difference in acceptable leak rate, the hermetic, uh, any fitting that is tested to hermetic uh, would also be considered, or excuse me, be required to undergo a five times strength test, uh, whereas those that would be tested as a closed system uh, are not required to do so. Uh, now, a manufacturer testing to ISO 14903 is able to stipulate their own control levels. So in theory, you could test as a closed system or closed fitting, uh, but uh, require that you, your, your system be tested to the hermetic requirement. 
Um, if we convert the standards uh, leak levels uh, to R410A, the hermetic level equates to roughly one to one and a half grams a year uh, of 410A, and the closed system is slightly higher than that uh, at around 1.3 to 2.1 grams per year of 410A. Um, again, those levels are taken at uh, 20 C and 10 bar, so that's room temperature and about 145 PSI. Um, next slide. And so what does that mean as far as the flammable refrigerants are concerned? So one thing we can do is, again, take, take those 14 out of 3 requirements and using, using some of the calculations from the standard itself, convert those values into uh, not only 410A uh, levels, but also flammable um, A2L refrigerants. So we have here R32, 454A, and 454B um, with their uh, with, the, with the corresponding leak rates at 20 C and 10 bar, or as close to it as it would allow for the fluid to remain in a gaseous state. Um, and so that's what you have uh, on the top part of this chart. It's in millibar uh, liters per second uh, leak rate. And then you can convert that into grams per year, and that is in the lower part. So you see that um, the hermetic level for uh, the flammable refrigerants is pretty much in line or slightly below um, what would be acceptable for uh, for 10A. Uh, next slide. Uh, and again, so what does that mean as far as safety um, and the lower flammability limit? So Mary kind of touched on this uh, initially, but there are different levels of charge, M1 through M3, and typical a typical 12,000 BTU uh, PTEC system will have typically two pounds of 410A uh, in the system. Uh, as far as the tonnage requirements for a cooling system or for an HVAC system in the past, uh, it was one ton of, of cooling or capacity for 400 square feet of space. But now more recently with improved technology as far as insulation, efficiency of systems, that has now been up to anywhere from 600 to 1,000 square feet per tonnage. Um, and so what that means, again, is that four pounds of a comparable A2L would, would need to be released into a room that is much smaller than what is typical today. Um, most uh, lower, flammability, lower flammability limits for A2Ls are around three tenths of a kilogram per cubic meter. Next slide. Uh, and again, just to wrap this up, what that means or what that translates to is that uh, anything less than four grams will take a significant amount of time to leak into a standard size room uh, and getting to the lower flammability limit. Um, and so, so it's just an illustration of, well, yeah, an illustration of the leak rates and how it would take, um, well, more, certainly more than any of our lifetime uh, to reach an unsafe level. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is just a, an example of some, some recent case studies for, for press fittings. Next slide. Uh, so this will be an introduction into kind of an installation guide for Press Connect. Um, you have the different types of tubing, which I think most people are familiar with. Uh, obviously, type M is not used for HVACR installation, so you're typically dealing with L or K or um, ACR tubing, uh, which is uh, typically coiled um, line set tubing. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, so very similar to plumbing press for water, uh, there's a tube inspection step just to ensure that there's no, there's no scratches, dings, dents, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, assuming that's all good, you would move to a deburring step um, so as to not nick or displace the o-ring during insertion. Next slide, please. Uh, you would then sand or, or polish the surface to, to clean it, make sure, making sure it's clean of, or uh, free of dirt and debris. You would then mark the insert, uh, insertion depth. Uh, typically, there is a tool of some type uh, included with these, with these types of fittings. 
uh, and to ensure that you, you plunge the tube uh, far enough into the fitting. Next slide. Uh, you would then press, um, you know, press press the product into place. Uh, again, uh, the particular system that is on display here is slightly different than than those that are centered over the O-ring. It's offset to one side uh, and pressed. And then once the press cycle is complete, uh, some of the systems do offer a gauge to check the press band diameter to ensure that uh, a proper press has been completed and and that the the joint is in fact safe so next slide please well and thank you very much uh presenters i really appreciate it and i'm going to take over the presentation from sean from here and just want to wrap it up and give everyone a summary of where we where we started out and where we've come today again as we keep uh sharing with folks in the industry the u.s is transitioning to low gwp refrigerants in most cases, A2O refrigerants will be uh, used and as part of this transition, uh, A2O refrigerants will be handled very similar to A1 refrigerants. Um, fittings for use with A2O refrigerants were recently evaluated in the ASHRAE research project. Um, as uh, Stefan went through, uh, the ASHRAE research project evaluated robustness, leak tightness of field-made mechanical joints, through a series of assembly, harshness, uh, durability, and leak rate tests. And uh, the ASHRAE research project focused on using uh, R32. Uh, it looked at flame-free joining methods. It looked at press crimped fittings, compression fittings, flare fittings. And it looked at a consideration of human factors on assembly time and success and in technician experience level. And what we found out of that uh, project was that um, really low leak rates were found uh, generally across the board. We discussed that, uh, but out of the work that was found there in this particular project, press connect fittings were found to have the quickest assembly time, lowest assembly failure rate, and are the most durable um, uh, in that test. And they have an acceptable leak rate of about one gram uh, per year per fitting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, then we went over and had uh, Craig give us a review uh, as Intertech is another one of the certification bodies that provides product testing and certification marking. Uh, Craig went through the UL207, which is a component and accessory standard that's used to test and ensure mechanical fittings and connections are acceptable, uh, acceptable in use for HVAC equipment. Um, he also uh, discussed and looked at um, how that is done and the requirements for testing and safely employing mechanical uh, fittings. It's a quite extensive standard uh, and uh, used quite heavily in the industry. And then Sean went over uh, press or quick connect uh, fitting technology. Uh, as one of the viable solutions for joining together tubes uh, without the use of uh, solder and flames for high pressure refrigerant applications. Um, and he looked at commercial available press tools that are being used for pressing um, uh, water tubes in combination with pressing tools or pressing jaws. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So just again, to, to wrap that up about the press connect fittings, there's a wide range of press connect fittings and ancillary products available. Uh, one manufacturer, as they shared today, did a large case study, uh, several large case studies actually, uh, looked at the Hard Rock, a public, uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and has over 10 million press connect fittings uh, out there with no issue known to date. Don't um, do that. Um, um, and uh, based uh, on the work with uh, 410A and R32 and 454A and 454B, uh, A2L refrigerants that are currently SNAP listed, those refrigerants have about the same leak rate as 410A. And based on the ASHRAE research project, adjusting for the fluid used, uh, press connect fittings were about six times uh, tighter than uh, the current hermetic requirement. So just want to share again um, the time to reach the LFL uh, for these uh, four gram or less leaks. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, 
So if we're looking at a 10 by 10 room, it's greater than uh, 1500 years. And I think if we look at a five by five room, it's greater than uh, 450 years uh, to reach the uh, LFL uh, in a typical room, uh, a typical five by five room. So I think with that, we're going to end our uh, webinar today and start answering questions. Um, so Helen, I think you saw some questions and um, uh, can you uh, share some of the questions with our presenters? I think we saw some come through for uh, Stefan. Uh, Helen, I think you may be on mute. Uh, let me go back here. Uh, Stefan, if you would, there were a few questions uh, that were uh, asking you about uh, the uh, ASHRAE Research Project. Could you uh, please state the question and answer some of those, please? Uh, sure. Let me, let me go to that list I saw here. Um, there was one question, um, if any consideration was giving, uh, given to chat lab uh, O-ring fittings. Um, these are common connections between refrigerant distributor and TXV or piston. Um, that, is, that is absolutely correct. Um, however, um, those were not included in the, in the study. And my guess is it was really because of you know, uh, timing and, and, and budget constraints. Um, there's a question here, what was the qualification for experienced uh, technician? Um, those are our uh, refrigeration technicians that we have at the company. Um, we only chose technicians that had uh, five or more years of experience, uh, many, um, you know, much, much, much longer than that. Um, so those were, were selected for, the, uh, for this part of the work. Uh, what else do we have? Um, what was included in the assembly time for each of the different fittings? Um, I think there was a note on one of the slides. Um, so depending on uh, the fitting type, um, it was, uh, you know, after cutting the tube, uh, deburring, cleaning, uh, some of them might require sanding um, and so forth. So all of these preparatory um, kind of activities were included in the, in the time. Great. And then let me direct a few questions over to Craig. I think we had a few questions on uh, UL207. Uh, Craig, could you uh, please answer? There were a few questions on UL207. Um, uh, the minimum design pressure and some of the other questions on UL207. Uh, yeah, one of the questions was on the design pressure pulled from UL207. So UL207 and uh, yeah, even UL1995, they, they provide tables which talk about the typical design pressure for different types of refrigerants. Um, they don't include all the refrigerants that are on the market. And most notably, they don't cover right, the, the new low GWP alternatives we're talking about. So what we do in those cases is you talk, we talk to the component manufacturer and say, what are you rating this for? What refrigerants are you going to market? And we cover the highest pressure, all right? And then what, what, what was another question that was in there? Oh, I, Tim, similar to that, there was talk of determining all the refrigerants that are necessary for compatibility or looking at that. And again, it's talking to the manufacturer and saying, what are you marketing? Um, let's see, what was another question I answered? Um, there was one on um, flare joint assembly with specific components or pieces certified in accordance with either UL 207 or 14903. Um, uh, could that, uh, in that case, does this present problems to use flare joints and products? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, it was from Phil Johnson. It's a little bit long um, and, and I'm not quite exactly sure of the question, but if you could read that one, I think there were two. Well, yeah. So Phil had some good questions. Those are more in depth, kind of what's happening with the current state of the standard in UL 60335-2-40, going from third to fourth edition, these things are being discussed and addressed, and things are happening in ASHRAE 15 as well, as those two are harmonizing. It's, it's kind of a, there'd be like a long-winded discussion on that, but I'm more than happy to have that with Phil one-on-one. -on -one. There was something else from, uh, I think it was, uh, maybe been Bruce, but it was regarding when do you use 207 versus 14903, and how is it determined if it's um, if, you, if you had a split system, 
And the answer to that is uh, you look, we look at the appliance standard such as dash two, dash 40, and it will tell you that for a split system, uh, if you're using an A2L refrigerant, those connections, they made in the field for the line sets, those connectors must, uh, where those joints are made, must comply with ISO 14903. That's what's current in the third edition of dash two, dash 40. The fourth edition, they're talking about adding UL207 because UL207 does now have a test for that as well. Great, and I think um, there's a, one other question I was gonna ask Sean if he would, um, uh, there was a question about uh, these large case studies, Sean, and I think uh, someone had asked whether or not the large case study, um, uh, do you have any uh, information and data on the time uh, that those are currently out in, in the field? I think someone had asked, um, you know, two points. One, they'd asked for how long uh, those have uh, stood up already, the large case study. And the other question is, I'm assuming the 250,000 cycles used for the testing in UL uh, 207 is probably connected to um, field time use, right? So if you could answer um, that, Sean, how long have those case studies been out there already on those large installations? Yes, yeah, so some of the ones that are, uh, sorry, some of the ones there that are listed um, are more recent um, builds. So like uh, the LA Ram Stadium, for example, SoFi Stadium uh, has been open now for, what, two years? Um, same thing with Mercedes-Benz, that's a, a little bit older. I think that's four, uh, four years older, four, four years older or so now. Um, I, I can speak from, you know, experience that uh, I know, you know, here, uh, again, being, we, you know, being a, uh, uh, having tested some of these products, we do have um, samples that are eight years, eight years old now um we were installed in the summer of 2013 uh, on systems actually outside um uninsulated so basically fully can uh exposed to to weather and stuff like that um that are still holding in fact uh it's one of the only functioning air conditionings uh, on the building so uh, it's a small um like mr slim style um unit but um but as far as data and stuff goes uh I, we do have some of that um, I think they can be shared. Um, I just have to uh, have to dig that up. So, okay. So that maybe that one. Nope. That that's great. So we have at least you know uh, on the order of uh, five to eight years um, for um, these large case studies, and we'll uh, work to get more information for folks that are on the phone um, who are uh, attending the webinar. Um, the other question I was going to ask. Um, uh, Craig, if it's possible, the um, field cycles that are used in the UL207, does that have a connection to the uh, field service lifetime? I'm assuming 250,000 uh, might be assumed to be like a 10 year or 15 year mark. Yeah, it's a, this is what's agreed on by the industry as, as kind of a, a good way to measure everybody, all components that you kind of saw on the list in my slides. Um, by no means do not take that as reliability, okay? Those are two different things. Manufacturers themselves do their own reliability testing. That 250,000, again, is a minimum safety standard that we use that was agreed upon by industry for certification. But yes, you're, you're on the right track of where, I don't remember the history of the exact number of years, but yes, there's gonna be something that was agreed upon by all the manufacturers, the testing agencies, and the code officials for those number of cycles. That's a great point. Again, we have to uh, keep uh, reflecting back that um, uh, those are um, those are minimums, and uh, what we're sharing here is minimum requirements. And a lot of manufacturers uh, will uh, meet the minimum, and then some. So these are all minimums. Uh, and uh, I think was there anything else that our panelists? I know we're probably a little bit over, but I think we could do another uh, a few minutes because uh, we still have a good amount of folks on here. Panelists, were there any other questions that we could answer very quickly? And then, um, and then we will work to answer the rest on our webinar, uh, uh, either in our webinar 
series or in, a, uh, in our website. Um, so panelists, are there any others that we could quickly answer because uh, we're a little bit over time today? Uh, Stefan, uh, Craig, or Sean, anything else of the questions that we could quickly answer? Um, I see one or two here. Um, compression of flag fittings, did you allow threat sealant uh, approved for refrigerant use? Uh, no, in this case, there was no uh, threat sealant we didn't use. There was one question about uh, torque wrenches. We did not use uh, torque wrenches. Uh, okay, and those are the shorter ones that I see. Right the okay, I think that was... Um, everything we're going to do for today, folks, I really appreciate everyone coming. I hope this gave everyone a great uh, review of, of all the different work that's been going on in the industry. Really appreciate our panel coming here today. Uh, Stefan for sharing with us uh, the great uh, research project that was done uh, through ASHRAE. Uh, again, really appreciate Craig sharing with us uh, the details of testing uh, labs and testing marks uh, and the details of the current UL 207 and how that connects to some of the other standards and the testing that was done. And then Craig, uh, Sean, sorry, Sean coming from RLS and sharing with us uh, different Press Connect fittings um, that, that are out there in the market and some of the large case studies that they've done and how uh, the Press Connect fittings and and some of the leak rates would connect to current uh, A2L refrigerants. So I think that's everything we have uh, for today. And uh, I appreciate everyone coming in. I'm sorry we went a little bit over time today, uh, but we will take the rest of the questions offline and answer those either through our website or through future webinars. Um, but with that, I'd like to close and appreciate everyone coming today.